Welcome back to In the Studio. Today, I have a nice 20 by 30 adventure in front of me. An adventure in paint. We don't know what's going to happen. We're going to make it... Uh, well, actually, I have some references today I've been looking at for years. Everyone can see them. So, this is an antique photograph which is kind of obvious, 19th century. And the other one is just the marsh scene, very contemporary. But I like the color tones in there, and I like the distant hills and trees in this one. So I was thinking of combining them into a 20 by 30, something like that. I don't know about this tree, but the rest of it, which I kind of like. So, you know, I'll keep the moods and the reference handy and see how uh, it develops. But first, like I always do, I work a little different these days, Dan, too. I, um, uh, years ago, I don't know if you remember, or if, did you ever watch me do demos before? Uh, not demos. I've watched you paint before, but you not with a uh, class. No, oh, okay. Years ago, I would cover the whole canvas like with that tone, which is pretty dark. Then I would work into it. And I would build up all over the camp. You know, maybe I should do that today. Actually, you know what? Thank you. <laughs> We're gonna get out the big <laughs> get out the big you, uh, for the sake of the new people, these are my WMDs. Weapons of mass description. <laughs> so, without further delay, I'm going to cover this canvas over. And you've probably all seen this at home, but we're going to do it again for the sake of the new people that are subscribing to Online Academy with Dennis Sheen. And it's beautiful as it is anyway. I mean, look at this. Beautiful tones, beautiful browns and greens. Just a couple of colors, that's all. Green and red, really. Have we done this before, Dale? Sure. In class, no, cover the whole thing, brown? Not dark, no, not that dark. Just not that really. Dark. I mean, I haven't painted like this in years, I don't think. But what happens in the process is that it balances the tones so much easier. You don't get all bogged down wondering about color. So your values are easier to see. The contrasts, the relationships, the values, and then the chroma, you add that with, with your opaque paints. This is all very neutral and it recedes because of the red and green together. The colors recede. They don't jump off. Which is really, you don't want to assault the viewer with glare and, and paint that jumps off too far. A lot of schools of painting they use pure color right out of the tube, mix them together, and they don't think in terms of neutrals. So sometimes those paintings have an abrasive effect on the viewer because you got to kind of, you know, just see what's going on and stuff, and you don't get that, that rich depth. Even blacks and shadows, they might use like just straight black and straight, you know, non-complementary colors. So I'm mixing my pale drying oil into this mix so I have a nice flow to the coverage. And that also will help when I start wiping off. Boy, this is great. Glad we talked about this. Yeah, me too. Man. This is very different. This is how I used to do it every painting for 10 years I did this. <laughs> But it really is, it's great for painters that are just starting out, which is what I used to do with all my workshops. I had people that were new to painting, and they were amazed when they saw what they could do with a few simple wipes of a bounty paper towel. I did say bounty. <laughs> I'm still waiting to hear back from them for my, <laughs> my residuals. Threatened to use Visa. Uh, yeah, there's all different kinds out there, but 
Bounty is the way to go for me because it has, has a nice textured side for those hard to do grasses and whatever and foliages and then it has a nice smooth side <laughs> which can do other things and get good half tones. But my mentor, Richard Schmidt, who I work with and study with and paint with for years and years and years, eight or ten years, he uses Viva. Is it Viva? Viva, yeah. Viva's very soft on both sides. It's like a baby diaper, like it's so soft. And it just doesn't work for me. I don't get the same effects. So, works for him. And his undertones will all be in, with turpentine. So by the time he begins like a still life or a portrait or anything else, it's really setting up really good. So it doesn't really, uh, you can't wipe off a lot of it. It just dries. So that his layering works at a la prima. It's at the first. So he can add color on top without getting muddy. And if, if, uh, what's the word I want? All right. Now. I don't know if I'm going to use those reference shots now because of this beautiful, beautiful background tone I have. Imagine putting a nice still life there, a brass bucket with some fruit, a nice, ugh, man, I should do that. I might shift gears. I, I don't have enough reference though. I don't know if I, I can see any uh, inspiration in here. See, I can do that. Yeah, I'll stick with my plan. Stick with the plan I have, I guess. Okay, folks, here we go. Or should I just make it up? Dale, what do you think? I think you should do what you're in the mood for. I know. <laughs> Don't you know. Well, just start it. I can't answer that question. So, without further delay, we'll take some bounty. And we'll just start randomly wiping off some tones, some of the paint. I don't wipe off too fast. I slow down a little now and I just, it's totally random. I'm squinting like this because I want to see shapes. And I want shapes to... Uh, come together and make sense. So I take little off at a time. I've already seen a landscape emerge, as you probably all are. Mm. So um, right at the outset, you already have something that uh, you just dream up. All of a sudden, something makes sense. And now, with those few little wipes I did, there's enough information for the painting to start dictating to me what to do. Before, I randomly made all kinds of a mess. But now that there's certain shapes that are cohesive and congealing and whatever you call it, now I have to be a little more careful. But I don't want to be too constrained. I don't want to lose the freedom I have to create and do anything I want in this painting. So it's a tricky balance at this point in this process. And I shouldn't have looked at it so closely because now I'm stuck with it. So there's some water. We'll bring up the sky a little more. Maybe we'll bring the... I don't want to lose the darks and the lights. I know that eventually I'll get some very strong lights into this. And you can make all different textures. And you can make foliage, do whatever you want with this paper towel. Look at the reds, the greens, the yellows, the, all different kinds of tones. So I'm going to take a little more off, and I'm going to have some foreground grasses. It's kind of like 17th century Dutch. Kind of like it actually. So I'm going to reshape some of the trees with my towel, pull out some more of the lights.
back in here. All the while trying to figure it all out. Do I want this to go all the way up top? Do I want to whittle it down? Maybe I want to whittle that down. This area here, I want to keep solid, so I'll get a brush and I'll fill this in more along here, the distance. Now, if I want to do any redrawing, yeah, I can use this brush. I can get that same mixture I had, just red and green. I'm surprised I don't lose any subscribers at home because all they get to see is the back of my ball <laughs> head. You know? It's all they see because the camera, you know. Anyway, so I'm going to um, delineate form, I guess is the word I want, and just pick out a few interesting elements that I want to draw attention to and get a focal point of sorts. And then I want to edge parts of the painting I know that are going to stay the way they are right now. So let's put that reflection there. Like that. And problem I'm going to have, and I can already tell, is that I'm going to not want to put any color on top of this. That's going to be my problem today. Because when I'm happy with a composition and a mood, essentially it's the mood that makes the painting successful for me. The mood and the composition. But what happens is, you start adding color and tones to the, the composition and you lose all the, the mood of it. Which is just one of the reasons I have 290 canvases lying around that are just brown. <laughs> because I don't want to put color on them because I'll ruin them. <laughs> and one of my favorite ones of all time is sitting here, which I did about 25 years ago, is this one. Because I know if I put color on that, it's going to be history. That one, I just happened to get something that I've never been able to duplicate it, so I keep this around. And of course, this one here, I showed the class a couple weeks ago. That's my inspiration, too, which I did this long before I did this. I did this one in 1980, probably 87, maybe 88, but anyway. It was the very first time I ever did a landscape. See, when I was coming up and studying art, I used to study in the Sotheby's and Christie's catalogs. That's where I first was exposed to tonalism in American landscapes, actually. So, all the catalogs way back that I could buy for five or ten dollars used were, were all black and white. So every painting in there, any landscape at all, looks like that. Brown and white, black and white. And I thought that was the original. So I'd go to the gallery where it was, or I'd go to the auction house, and it'd be in color, and I'd go, oh, it's <laughs> gross, it's ugly, it's horrible. Where's the mood? Where's the atmosphere? Because can you picture that all with reds and blues and everything? It's not going to do it. Not for me, anyway. So all my paintings were brown and white and black and white. So let's open up. We need the eye to transverse all through the painting. So we need avenues for the eye. So let's see what we can do about that. Soften that up. Then the eye is going to come through here. It's going to hit the top. Now it has to come through here. So I'm going to squiggly Squiggle a line. I can keep some of the lines. 
can break it up, but your eye's still going to shoot across. But it also can go from the top to the bottom. And if you overdo it, you just put more paint on. You know, you just get your paint and just, like this tree, I want back. I'm going to lighten up the bottom of the sky, the horizon here. This is kind of an evening scene, I would guess, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe way, maybe very late evening. Let, let's bring the tree back down. I mean, it's, I don't even know what else to do. I'll ruin it. <laughs> I don't want to ruin it. Let's put some color. I can introduce some tones. So let's get a little more foliage color going here. Reddish. As you can see on the palette cam, a reddish orange over there. So let's put that in. Let's dance it in. As well as some of the greens. A variety. Reds, orange, green. And in the foreground tree areas. I probably wouldn't do this that much years ago. I would leave it all brown as you could see from the earlier works there. Maybe I'll add a vertical tree out there. Let's go back into here. Now all of this is probably reflecting down into here so I gotta show that. Although where the white is, the lights Show that. And there. Like that. Then, if I want to maybe take off a little more paint to get a brighter light, I dip it in the pale oil and work my way around. foliage and trees. Let's trim that down a little. Let's lighten up down here. I mean, I see blues. I don't know where blue could possibly come from with a red and green mixture. But that's cool. And up top, I want to lighten up some of the sky up top, so I'm going to do that. Now as I come down, I want to leave ghost edges, I call them, of the trees and foliage and maybe even wispiness of clouds. Let's just bring that back a bit. And let's soften this down. It's a little too dark there. This tree, this, uh, I can also take the paper towel with the little tone on it and go over an area and add a little color to it. I could also make a violet. Let's take a violet. So a little red, a little blue. My alizarin and my severs. And we'll just plug that in. and take off some again because I want the light to go up and out and down and across. I just keep playing until my eye says, stop! You're good! What should I do in here? Well, let's try this. There. 
That's all it needs. That's all it needs. Now I can show a few more um, sky holes through the trees. As the teacher said in art school, let the birds have room to fly through. What are we going to do up here? That's too dark. You know, I haven't done anything quite like this in a long time. I'm going to lower this a little bit. It's still an important shape, but I want to just lower it a little. And I'll add a few uh, tree trunks and branches going through my woods here. And again, a little brighter. I'm going to soften down my water here with my paper towel and give it a little movement to it. And my field, grasses out there, I'm going to lighten up a little bit. And the bottom of the trees in the mid-distance, I want to come across here a little more. Kind of like that. Now, if I so choose, I can put some trunks, which I hate to do because they can be distracting. But I'll pick out a couple of tree trunks, let's just say. Lighter. Delicately. Don't want them too strong, so I'll tone them down with my finger. Like that. And you can put some up in the tree, too, if you want. See, that? I, I don't like that. Knock a few off. That's it. What else can I do? <laughs> we'll lighten up a little bit of the grass here. <laughs> Just let the eye have a little bit of textures to look at in the foreground. I mean, I could put rocks and twigs and branches and boulders and all kinds of stuff. I could put a woodsman in there if I wanted to. There's so much going up here, and there's only a little bit of reflection, so I'm kind of, it's not exactly how nature would look, I don't think, but hey, it's how my nature, I want my nature to look.
All right, we have a 20 by 30, all done in browns, red and green actually. Uh, did I use yellow? I don't know. I did make some violet, but you don't even see the violet anymore. So, see you next time in the studio. Hopefully it's working. Okay.